So good morning ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your patience. It is now 11.05 which was the advertised start time so I feel that I am able to start and everybody else should have known we were starting by now. So thank you all very much for coming, I do appreciate it. My name is Shara Lodgen, I am the Faculty of Life Sciences and Computing's Learning and Teaching Coordinator and this is one of our FLSC Learning and Teaching meetings. We will be having a few more across the summer and then across the year as per usual. This one is about Blackboard Collaborate. Blackboard Collaborate is a tool produced by Blackboard, the people that produce WebLearn for us. It is, I am reliably informed, far more than a web conferencing tool, but we have primarily used it in a web conferencing context. We were invited by Blackboard to take part in their pilot of this tool, and some of our colleagues from FLSC, particularly from the School of Human Sciences, and some of our colleagues from CELT have been involved in piloting this Blackboard Collaborate tool. Now at the moment we don't have this tool uh, beyond today, uh, sorry, no, beyond next week, I'm sorry. Um, but we are hoping that if there is sufficient interest in the potential uses of this tool, if you uh, agree with us that we think this is pretty great, that you might be interested in considering how you might use this and that might help us to put forward MET 2020 bids to ideally get this university-wide and failing that FLSC want it just for themselves. See what you think. Okay, so it has been piloted by FLSC um, and by CELT and we do have presentations from contributors uh, across those two departments. So I'm going to be very pleased in a moment to welcome Sheila Yuff and Sean Frost from the School of Human Sciences. Later myself and Sheila will tell you a bit, uh, a bit more about the student experience <coughs> particularly. And then finally JD from CELT is going to tell us about some of the uses that he's been putting Blackboard Collaborate to. We will give you opportunities for questions as we go through. So please wait for those opportunities and write your questions down if you think you're going to forget. Okay, so Sheila and Sean, if I could invite you to start please. Right. Thank you very much, Shara. Um, I'll start and then Sean will be talking to you as well. Um, the idea behind this for me came when I was putting together um, the distance learning blood science masters that we launched in February. When I actually put the um, details together to, to suggest the course, I said we needed this type of tool, some sort of like web conferencing, to bring the students from their distant places in together and give them a learning community. Because one of the big problems is they do feel isolated and you tend to lose students. Um, and we will refer to their experiences as we go through. Um, so what we wanted to try and do is give them a sense of community. Um, then Blackboard approached us, we got the opportunity to pilot this and we thought we'd be a bit cheeky and we'd run it with our face-to-face -face students as well. So we'd get as much idea and feedback from the students as possible. So, like we said, it's not the only web conferencing software. Um, and what, do, what does this type of software allow us to do in general? Um, what we can do is, lots of companies hold them for meetings, lots of you will have actually signed into a webinar um, rather than go to the States to listen to something or fly out to Turin. In the old days it was much nicer travelling. But costs and everything else, time and people's availability mean that this type of tool has become much, much more common. So you can get people to get from different locations together in an environment. Um, they can do learning within real time, so they can um, ask us questions, they can get feedback instantly. And we can slot in different tools into it. You can pop in video clips, you can take them on a tour of a website while they're with you. Um, and the advantage of something like Collaborate is they have a plan tool, which means you can, it's almost like putting up your PowerPoints. Um, and you can follow that, so if you were feeling poorly or something else happened to you, there'd be ways of getting in there. But we can get the students to create resources and share them with each other, pop them back into the environment and everything else there. So it's good for collaboration, it's good for group work. So it can be used um, for small online workshops, um, small group tutorials, um, the idea with having this type of tool as well is when we run 12 tutorial groups, why can't we just have a core that is the same that's delivered and then be able to get the students from the different tutor groups to pop things back in. So that would actually make it more powerful and they'd be sharing their learning with each other. 
Um, we didn't use it for things like postgraduate supervision, but one of the other universities that was doing part in the tool is going to do it, it was doing that with it. Um, but we could expand it to things like recruitment activities, open days, induction. Indu how many times do we see a small handful of students in induction week? And that's when we deliver all the important things about how to get around the university, how to um, find when their coursework's due, all those sorts of things, because we don't teach them that after. So if we did that, we can capture this material and they can go and look at it online if they don't come and join us live at the time from wherever they are and reduce their travelling costs. Okay. And we could do things like online open office hours. Um, the number of times I'm sat there in a student has booked an appointment to come and see me in my time slot. Somebody else rings you know, through to me, says, can I see you? And I'm saying, well, not really, because they're not there. If you were doing it on something like this, you could hold people and say, right, somebody hasn't turned up, so I can deal with you now. But quite often you're making them wait in case this other student turns up late. Okay, so I'm going to get Sean to describe why Blackboard Collaborate would be better than some of these other tools. Hi, guys. Just to put this into context before I start talking, I just started teaching in February, so I'm very naive for learning environments and learning tools, so it is very simple to use, I find it quite easy to pick up. It's really benefited both the distance students, because they've had actual lectures, rather than simply being sent material through the post, and the contact students as well, who we ran online revision sessions for. It seamlessly integrates with our current VLM, so there's no issues around conversion or having middleware in there. We can do live sessions, where we have students physically interacting with us, not physically interacting with us, you know what I mean. And we can also record materials for them to review in their own time. It provides our distance students with an interface for the academics. It also widens participation because no longer is geography a restriction for who can attend our university. So it widens participation and also pushes our market boundaries further than they currently are. As I said, I'm an extremely uh, new lecturer. I found it very simple and easy to use, and I've taught my colleague to use it in a couple of hours to quite a decent standard. He says. <laughs> oh, thank you. So when we're actually teaching using Blackboard Collaborate, this is what we see. So we have a <coughs> video panel, and whoever's talking, whether that be the student or the academic, the camera drags to their computer. We have a list of participants and tools here, so we can allow students to talk to each other, or we can restrict that. We can restrict access to the whiteboard, so allow students to draw in this space here. And we can also allow students to upload their own work there, but that's all, that's all tools that you control yourself. We've obviously got a whiteboard, and this is where it really supersedes the current options available, such as Skype and Instant Messenger. It brings all of those tools together in a single tone, which is very effective, well, I found certainly very effective. Because we can record this, as it appears and send us out as it appears, people aren't disadvantaged if they're, say, sick or have childcare issues or whatever may be going on in their lives beyond academia. It means that they can still benefit from the same learning experience as everybody else did that attended the session. Is that you or me? Right. So, in my case, I can't read my own writing. So, there's <laughs> little point of me taking notes in lectures, which is, I always feel quite disadvantaged because of. No worries. Because of the way the software works, you can simply review it, stop at the time points, carefully write out what you need to if you're a sort of kinetic learner, and move on that way. It allows a thorough uh, review of revision material because you're not relying purely on a set of notes that you managed to get down at the time. You can actually go back to the physical source it came from. It provides an environment for synchronous interaction, so that's not just academics and students, that's also students between each other to work in projects outside the university. And we found it really encouraged engagements. We have a student in St. Martin who was, I think, on the fence about whether she was going to continue the distance course or not. And as soon as we introduced her, she started re-engaging um, to a very high standard. I've got quite a short video here of students working together. It's not as the recordings appear, because it's an MP4, but it'll give you a good idea. So the students are trying to identify uh, an atypical antibody, like you'd see in clinical practice. They start by having no idea what the answer is. They work together without being involved at all, and by the end, three minutes, they've got a solid answer that would stand up to any clinical laboratory. When it decides to start, so. It's coming up. You can run it earlier. I think 
Thanks. I'm disappearing for, let's say, five minutes. Can everybody work together and identify what this antibody is? Okay, so he said it's um, the ENZ uh, is more than the IAT, so it would be RH. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah. in this case, I guess it is not RH because uh, IAT and ENZ, they are the same. Mm -hmm. So it must so, be yellow. Yeah, so we can look for a pattern and see. <coughs> we'll just skip the important bit, I think. So like in, in, like, like in this situation, uh, like what should we decide? Like what should we mention? Oh, but hang on, you know, like little k is positive. Do you see? Little k? Little k? k? Yes. For all of them. Yeah, uh, it is positive for all of them except of the k. So, so what's the significance of this then? Well, which one is Dauphia? Sorry, I'm, I'm confused. The C is the FYA and the FIB. Okay. Okay, I think there's some very good yeah, answers there. Right. So, what do we agree yeah. on? Yeah, Sorry, Brian, go ahead. FYA. I agree. Christina, good job. Absolutely right. Um, so, it's a direct match for FY, egg. Um, Duffy antigen, as well, remember, is very important to malaria. Okay, so that gives you an idea that they went off to a room on their own. One of the students didn't have a mic, so she was actually typing questions up in the chat at the time, so they were integrating there. But they were in totally different places, these students, and they were there talking to each other like they were there together. Things like the um, panel that they'd been given can be sent as a push tool, so you can actually put a document, and even on the recording, they can click on the link that it says would you like to download this and they can actually click and get whatever document you've sent them as well so they're not disadvantaged if they don't do the live session they can eavesdrop on somebody else's live session and they can still get the same documentation so it is very very useful <coughs> they like interacting with us as well during the during the sessions they can um, ask us questions what we found was with our face-to-face -face students, um, the, they were a bit more reticent to join in at the beginning, but once they heard us talking to each other, then the, definitely the third level six students started talking as well, asking questions, and they were then typing questions up as well. So once they acclimatise the environment and they get used to the tools, they feel a little bit more confident using them there. Um, students, the advantage is they can learn at their own pace. Like Sean said, if you can't take notes fast enough in a class, sometimes you can disengage. You know, you switch off, you think, oh, I've, I don't know what that point was, I've missed that, I don't know. So being able to go back to the material is a really, really strong point for them. They can then engage with it and be able to turn around and say, oh, look, I, you know, I, that's the bit I didn't understand. Or they can come back to us and ask, if, even if they've seen a recording, because quite often they've missed the moment in a lecture, and if you miss... A concept then you can lose the whole thread for our lecture area um, we can provide like we said we can provide supplementary lectures it can be supplementary to lecture materials um, we've recorded things like a metabolism tutorial to help students um, because we didn't want to run it live and then they could ask questions when we went online um, after doing it there it can fit anybody's busy lifestyles there so we're going to show you another short clip um, just of how we can run it if it's academics leading a revision tutorial so <coughs> I'd like all of you to remember that these are just sort of clues and we're going to try and encourage you uh, to understand how to expand the um, answers for these. So hopefully now this will flick to the next page. Yay, there we go. <laughs> um, you never know, I might know what I'm doing by the end of this session. Um, this was my first time. This is a typical <laughs> type of question that we can do there. When we're talking about anemias, um, earlier on in this session and if you look here you can see that a lot of this is associated with um, anemia like, um, 
We talked in the PowerPoint that I provided earlier on, we had the mean cell volumes. If you look at this, this shows that it's microcytic, it's got low mean cell volume. And if you look at the blood film comments at the bottom down here, these are also important for you to make your um, diagnosis. So the question asks you to discuss the significance of all the above results. And sorry, in this case it's below because I had to set it like this for you to be able to see the question. And you need to suggest your differential diagnosis. Okay, so you can see that it gives us the opportunity to emphasise a little bit more about how they should be tackling the question. And in other recorded sessions, we've had several tutors online at the same time, and we've asked each other questions, sometimes genuinely, because it was like, oh, that's interesting, and I didn't know about that, because we've all got slightly different specialisms. And then other times, we could just sort of take a step back and just add the questions that we know the students should be asking, because we know that that's really where they should be look, focusing their attention. So some of the, we did some research about what has other, have other people found, um, there's not many people that use this tool currently, but there's a group in Aberdeen that do, and there's um, obviously a branch there, some universities that are using it. And what they found is that students have more time to reflect on what they've done, process their ideas, and they've become much more creative in the type of answers they give in response to either coursework or examinations that they've done. They found it's in, in, enhanced their critical analysis and sort of shown a bit more depth to things. And we think this is because students get to learn from each other, they've got an area where they can discuss points with each other, and it's quite a safe environment. If they want to do it anonymously, you don't have to have the post show, put their names up. So. Um, the students, if they feel a bit embarrassed, if they think, because, you know, it's like putting your hands up in a class, if you think you're going to ask a stupid question, you don't want everybody looking at you going, oh, you're the one who asked the stupid question. In this environment, they can ask the question without being thought of as being stupid. But I usually say to the students, the stupid one is the one you don't ask, because if you don't know it, I can guarantee there'll be other people in the room that don't. So it helps with all these types of things then. Um, and they found that they, it's been better at supporting students during things when they've used it there. Um, they found anxiety levels within the students decrease as they use the tool more often. So for our pilot, everything that we've done has usually been first shot. You can see they're not so keen to interact. Um, but it, we, we noticed a transition for the second year students who didn't really interact at all in the first session to actually having a go at interacting in the second session that we did with the revision sessions we did earlier this week. So I think it's not all about students, so there's a lot of benefits for us as well. There's no such thing as altruism. I think it really it better reflects modern learners and modern learners' expectations. <coughs> I thought the Student Union President made an excellent point at the Learning Teaching Conference that academia is a long way behind the expectations of, of modern students where everything moves very quickly and they don't really want to wait for responses. It can be recorded as an actual live screenshot, as an MP4 video like you've seen, or as an MP3, so students can revise while they're on the train or wherever they want to be listening to the MP3s. It reduces repetition and it increases consistency. There's a plan tool that supplements this which allows you to, as, as the title suggests, plan your lectures, but much like a traditional lesson plan. That can be retained, sent out, reused, updated. So it means that you're delivering a constantly much more, uh, much more consistent message to your students, not only within the same week, but within years and years and years, and you can see as things develop. And I think it allows us to better deliver learning at a time and place to suit the learner. We've delivered on uh, mostly evenings for the distance guys, because they tend to work. We've delivered on Saturday morning for students who just can't attend university and they're, they're, they're massively disadvantaged. Education is increasingly costing students more and more and they demand value for money. I think this really helps to deliver that. So, but wait, there's more. <laughs> it helps us be more efficient with our time. Rather than delivering four, le four identical lectures, we can deliver one lecture. So it improves consistency, and it also means that we're getting better use out of our working week. It permits the teaching of difficult content. The panel that I showed you earlier, the, there's no way somebody can learn that by giving them information and simply sending them away to look at panels. You have to work through that with them. 
it's intensive, that's done one-on-one, -on -one, and it's not terribly efficient. Whereas if you can deliver it to a group as we did, it works much more better. It improves our work-life balance, because if you're teaching online, generally I do it at home, so once I finish teaching, I'm in my kitchen having a cup of tea. It encourages student engagement. It brings teaching teams together. We've been running our blood science uh, revision tutorials, and William, Sheila, myself, and Ken Hudson have all been able to work together as an academic to tease out our little areas of specialism for the students. And also, did you want to talk about contingency? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think one of the things as well is um, they, when we were trying to plan this meeting today, um, I was done actually very well. So we held the meeting through Collaborate, and because I had no voice, I was typing most of my messages. But it meant that I could still engage and still deliver. And if you, you have things like when the weather's bad or transport, there's tube strikes and stuff like that, it means that students could still have their lecture. We could still deliver what they needed and what they wanted. And we're not impinged by the fact that they can't get into the same physical room as us. I did point out the only thing is, is if you're stuck on the train and it can't go until they've spent all those millions on making Wi-Fi available, it might be a bit difficult. And I'm not sure my the people in my carriage would like to be listening to the lecture I'm trying to give down the other end. But it does widen things up for us, and it, so it gives us more advantages. And um, Sean was saying that you know we could invite specialist guest speakers. They could be at home in Newcastle and they could come on and do something for an hour with us rather than spending five hours travelling, you know, on there, going there and back, coming to be with us for two hours uh, and all the, the, that entails and the costs it does. And we know that these types of tools, one of the universities on the pilot had somebody talking from France, so it is good value. You can expand things there, give them more there. So I think regarding sort of the umbrella, approach to the benefits of this. It's a, it's a real blue ocean tool in that none of our other local competitors are using anything like this. If you're a distance learner looking at courses, the only way you're going to get the sort of interaction is through Blackboard Collaborate, which we hope to offer. It, can drive, it combines the strengths of very expensive software and hardware. So for me, this is a Skype, instant messenger, uh, email, all, all in one. But also things like morphology, which are going to be one in a second, that requires a very expensive multi-headed microscope, whereas we could use this instead, but also provide a permanent record of that teaching session, so it's not being repeated year on year. We'll simply put it in the unit for them to access in their own time. Increase our mark profile, because it is extremely unique and very novel. Widens participation for the reasons I said earlier, and the same for more efficient use of academic resources. And I think it also helps to support the evolution of MOOCs. While I appreciate there's an awful lot of evidence that says MOOCs don't actually make any money, they tend to lead students into courses that are fee paying. This is a good opportunity to introduce Blackboard Collaborate to the student, and as Sheila was saying earlier, um, stress levels decrease, anxiety levels decrease over time using this. If you use this for your free MOOC and then come on to a paying course, you've already reduced your anxiety levels because you know how the software works. Okay, so, so far, um we made the slides before we did an extra two hours for level five and level six this week on there. Um, we've delivered quite a lot of material to students using it there. So we've, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the student feedback that we've had from their experiences. Um, we've managed to teach um, distance learning students um, in two different subject areas. We've been able to teach two different levels of undergraduate areas as well. So we've been able to pull everybody together and uh, get these things done there. So we've had quite a good play on the pilot. So we encountered the things that are problems and we've actually managed to overcome them. But we're quite keen on the tool and other people who've had a quick look are quite keen that it's actually much more flexible and much easier to use than you'd expect it to be. So. Um, it's allowed us to do um, teaching material that, like um, Sean said, it's very difficult sometimes uh, to teach online. Um, we put lots of stuff up in our web learn as it was. We've had recorded lectures of some of the material. We've put up um, different papers for them to read. But there's always that element of they are on their own. And this sort of stops them being so isolated. It brings them into a learning community even though they're not physically with you, it makes them feel that they're not the only one. And I think with distance learning, that's one of the biggest hurdles. <coughs> when there's a problem, you think nobody else has this problem, nobody else has ever had this problem, and that you're struggling. And if they can integrate with other people, they feel like they're part of a good community. So 
like we said, teaching hours can, to suit the learners. All the distance learning students, when I've looked on, on WebLearn, access things at different times. They have little peak flurries of activity, so obviously they take a week off to catch up with stuff, and they'll, they'll do things, a lot more activity happens at the weekends, which traditionally that's when we're not doing so much activity. Um, but they can then bring it together there, and we can bring specialists, like we said, in for revision. We're going to show you an idea of teaching something that's quite difficult to do, that you would normally have to do one-to-one, -one, or if you're lucky, if you've got a multi-header, you might have three or four students with you. So we see we've got some nice, normal neutrophils, fairly granular, with between four and six lobes. So they're not the hypersegmented neutrophils that we would see in the megaloblastic anemia. We've got a fairly reactive lymphocyte, but not panicky. In isolation, this was, is what we would call an ignorocyte, i.e. cell that we would ignore. We've also got a stomatocyte, and we've got a little bit of polychromasia or basophilic stippling in this red cell here. The morphology itself is fairly typical of what you'd see in a healthy patient. There are always going to be some agent erythrocytes and there are always going to be some very new erythrocytes. This is a very, very healthy example of erythrocyte. Because there is not an overwhelming amount of any particular feature, we would report this as a normal film, with no specific comments made about any of the morphology we see. So moving on to iron deficient anemia. You can see that this is markedly hyperchromatic when you compare it to the previous film. There's also many microcytes, so small cells. And all of these, well, most of these erythrocytes have large areas of central palate. They literally don't have enough iron. It, there is not enough iron in the body to successfully create enough hemoglobin to fill these pages for um, oxygen to be transported through the veins. Right, I'm going to stop that there. That shows you, and that's the type of thing that when I was first learning this sort of thing, somebody would say to you, oh, look at 12 o'clock on the film. So you'd then go look down the microscope, and you probably weren't looking at the same thing. So it is much, much more accurate way of being able to guide them to what they actually need to know and what they need to look at. If I can just add there, I think it's really good for comparison in this case as well. We're not taking a slide <coughs> to the stage, putting a new slide on, trying to get everybody refocused. It's literally on the next slide and we're straight on, so it's much more efficient in terms of time. Okay, so from our experiences, we can make sure that the students understand before they leave our little virtual world that we brought them into. Um, we can have an idea of their, their demands as well. They look, after we did the first tutorial session with our level six students, they were asking if we could run another tutorial on a Friday for a different module because they liked it so much, they wanted to do that again. At the time we hadn't agreed an extension with Blackboard and it was just all too difficult. Um, so we said that we can't this time, but we managed to be able to do it and, and bring it back for them this time there. So we felt like we delivered value, didn't we? Absolutely. So, um, Students can network, um, it encourages much more student-led learning. They can then work out the things they want there. Um, Sean's given them the opportunity to decide what they'd like a tutorial on um, for the distance learning students, because sometimes they can engage with just what's on there. They don't really need to learn that. But there are other things when they've got the difficulties, they can say, that's what I want the tutorial on, I don't understand that. Um, and we usually give them the opportunity of choosing when they want a session by doing a doodle calendar and we offer them four or five different times and we'll spread it about. So if there's, <coughs> we, we go for the maximum number of students who can make it, but then occasionally if we, we look at it and we think, oh, that student from St. Martin hasn't been able to do it for the last two sessions, let's make sure the session that we run is the one she can make. So we, try, we can move it around like that and everybody has the value of looking at it there. So, um, and we feel that students have benefited holistically from the whole thing. It's enhanced their learning. Um, I saw an improvement of some of the third year's answers in their, in their first attempt exams. And I think that was because they'd heard us talking and expanded it and realised they can talk, add things they learnt in year one and year two on the way through, that that was appropriate, whereas they tend to silo their learning normally. Okay, <coughs> so just to sort of sum up, it isn't the cure-all, 
there will be challenges with web learning conferencing and um, Sarah Cornelius and Tim Newman have done quite a lot of work up in Aberdeen and they've used Collaborate and they've had to go with the tool that was predeceded to Collaborate which is Illuminate. What Blackboard have done with Collaborate to improve it is just move it on that little section where they're saying it's, this is for teaching, it's not for running a business, it's not for running a conference from somewhere else. We're trying to actually use it to enhance the teaching and learning experience for students. So, um, we're going to send this out, you can't read those references typically uh, there, so um, we'll send it out there, but these are some good bits on, on references for setting up sessions in the first place, people's experiences using it, the learning theory behind using it, whether it's an advantage or disadvantage, and obviously some of the teaching challenges. Because from our point of view, is we have to know that we can <coughs> leap over that little tiny hurdle and <coughs> use it for lots and lots of different things. So while we put the last slide up, we'll take questions if that's all right. Yes, please, just a Yes? So while you're running it, can you switch to your computer or a student computer to see what they're doing or you are doing. Show yes. them a different piece of software, for example. And yes, you can swap it around. You can take them to websites. You can okay. um, bring them back to things there. Like we said, you can give them documents because you can upload, them, push the document to them and stuff like that. So yes, it is very flexible in that. In that, you're not confined to it. You can show them the whole of your screen. They can show you their screen. They can write on their own whiteboard and put it into, you know, you can invite them to put it into your main presentation as well. So it is very flexible for them and they can, they can um, you know, engage with it much better. If I can add to that, you can actually use, like you were saying, computer programs that are on your computer physically task on the thing. So I was thinking SPSS and complicated software <coughs> you can physically run them through how you operate that off the computing guys. You can run them through a specific piece of yeah, software. That's, that's why I was asking. You. Absolutely, yeah, you can do that. I think it was Christine next. You switch on the number of microphones that can be live at any one time, so you can select from three to uh, up to six, I think it is the maximum. But you, what you do is you get them. There's a little hand button. If I slide back to, yeah back to here there's a little hand tool here so you can get them to press that and that says I want to ask a question so we can when you're t doing a session you can see that and then you can say okay and you give them the mic you know click it so they can have the microphone um, and then you can take the microphone off for them afterwards um, one of the things that at the end of a session you always have to ask them to leave the room properly otherwise you have to sort of like click it to evict them please so give them a bit of a warning because otherwise your recording goes on for about four and a bit hours with one of us didn't it yeah. because we didn't know but we were learning just as much as they were learning um, they can do things like poll on it ask questions and stuff like that so it's quite good um, did that is that everything for you Christine David I was just asking is there a maximum number of students who can participate in these um, technically no they do ask at blackboard if you're going to run an examination or you're going to run something that you're collecting specific data for um, that if you're going to have more than 150 people you just let them know and I think what they do is they make sure that their channel space is available and that it's not going to collapse and they'll probably move things to other areas so that if you were running an exam via it it wasn't going to crash out your whole exam or something in the middle of it so using all can use the mic at one time, but then you probably wouldn't want 150 people trying to talk on one go, pressing the because if they just press the talk button. So I think it is nice to limit it, but you can let ev you can swap it between everybody, so they're not stuck. It's not like you get one and they can't, nobody else can talk. So and, and just to say that uh, University of Dubai have actually been running with thousands. Yes. Yeah, that's they, they, they said, didn't they? they yeah, they just let them know if it's a big number of people that are going to have to do something at one time. Yeah. So, Ken? Yeah, is there a facility for students choosing a response? Say you want to ask a question, you've got four different answers, and you, you want to get up, say, 100 responses to that. Can you collect that information? Yes, you can. There, there's, um, there's, a qu there's a quiz tool, so you can answer, so they can answer A, B, C, D, however many you want. Or there's a polling tool as well, so they can say yes or no. So you could, and you can collect all that, and all that de detail gets collected at the back end as well. So you can actually print out 
you know, how many answered this question, you know, how many got it right with A and stuff yeah. like that. So that's all that's all capturable. It's a bit like um, in the back end of WebLearn, there's quite a lot of data and statistics we can pick up that, you know, probably we don't use effectively, but we could do. And that, but the, if you want to pick up data from WebLearn, it's very, very <coughs> I don't think it's any data with, with um, it seems to be a little bit easier with this. The only thing is, because we've run the pilot out of one module instance, we've had to send everybody a link to everything. So when we look at the data for some of the other modules, we can't actually work out which of the students were doing it, where we could if it was run within that module, but because um, they let us play around with it, and we just sent the link out for people to join us. And if it was within the module, when it's within the module, they don't have as much problem joining the sessions as well. Okay, there's you first, and then it was you. I just wanted to say, ask about um, whether you noticed any, particularly in the distance courses, if you noticed any sort of cultural differences in the way people interact with the, with the webinar, in terms of how willing they are to speak. Um, and I said I said that because I was in, I went to two, I suspect, in two webinars, one from the US and one from the UK, and noticed that in the US everyone was kind of shouting and getting involved and really happy to take the mic, whereas in the UK people were a bit more reticent about talking. Um, and I just wondered if with your distance courses in different areas, different parts of the world, you noticed any dif differences in how people participate? Um, because it's only been a pilot and the students that we used it for on distance learning, we didn't use it on a lot of our distance learning co modules that we've got, we just used it on a couple of particular ones. We had more students on some of the other modules, so there were only four students, so the maximum we ever had to join it there. And I think because there was only four of them, they didn't feel that it was much of a problem. I think once somebody had said something, then the others would join in. And the girl that didn't have a mic for one of the sessions, she, she used chat really effectively, so she was still engaging. Um, and I think maybe because they were master's level students as well, they felt a bit empowered to say, oh, I need to ask this and I want to get something out of it. So it would be slightly different how you do it with, say, first years of... I think so. I think it's a progressional tool that you would make it quite simple when they're you know, first exposed to it. Um, and you'd give them more opportunity to interact together as, as they go through sessions, you know, as they go through their degree. Sorry. Yeah, does it have accessibility features for disabled students? Um, one of the things, because we didn't put the slide up this time, and I did a presentation sort of talking about it before, one of the things we were asked for was for a transcript to post it, and we couldn't do that in the time frame that we had. But luckily, because she had the, she was a deaf student with a transcriber, <coughs> he could still listen and write it out for, you know, write out the key points for her. Um, she chose to come to a live session when she was doing a reset, so I think for her she found that a bit better. But I do believe there is a way of doing a transcription from it. All the chat can be transcribed instantly after you've finished. So I think there would be an element, if you knew somebody was very dependent on that, it would be good for us to pop it into chat and write it as well as the things that were being said live so that you could interact, which is why I think some of the sessions when there was four of us working were quite good, because somebody would ask a question and I'd be typing up answers at the bottom so that that was being fed through while other people were dealing with a slightly different live question. I was thinking in particular so. about blind students, that we have mm -hmm. one kind of going to our third, into our second, and there have been issues with software and screen readers and I was wondering if there's any, any accessibility features for blind students. Um, they can change the size and, of the text and they can change the background colours themselves. So they can so, be blind. Well, um, I mean, there's, there's still the they audio They can hear options. it. Yeah, that's why, we, that's why when there's chat going on, we always say what the question is in chat so that if somebody right. else. But it, it, audio's okay, <coughs> but if you have something that you're showing on screen. Sure. I, I think it. I mean, this isn't meant to sound really horrible there, but it's very unlikely that somebody who's blind would be getting a job doing hematology morphology. Well, so, but that 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 I'm not disrespecting the fact that there's lots of other things they could do. But I think from our experience, we haven't tried it with something where that would become an issue. But we could we could go to Blackboard and ask them because they do run it in other places, and I'm sure they've got other techniques. Just Sorry? chip in there. Do you mind if I chip in? No. Um, the, the issues around accessibility uh, are to do with the way we design the content so that uh, screen readers like Jaws can pick up 
the content we intend. But that's, the, that's the whole question, though. Uh, is, can, can JAWS or other software read <coughs> the content on the <coughs> screen that is being shown? Provided it's designed with the WAI uh, initiatives uh, standards in mind. So anything that you present, if, it's, uh, if it conforms with the WAI standards, which is the Web Accessibility Initiative, uh, screen that you should have to pick up. Right, but this is this is a piece of software that you, you're, you're showing through your through the screen. Yes. So, is Jaws able to actually actually read that? And is, is Jaws the best software to actually use? Because we we've had problems uh, with uh, Jaws unable being unable to read <coughs> software uh, for a first year student, and it's been quite problematic. And that's why I'm just asking: is is this compatible with um, accessibility features to allow a blind students to actually interact with it. Because if it's not, then somebody of that, of that type of disability is going to be yeah, there's, there's a huge amount on, on, uh, in the Blackboard and around the research of accessibility. It's a very complex question because it does involve so much more than just running software. It's to do with the, you know, the learning design, how, how you present the information from that software. So it's, it's a very complex issue that's not always successful. You can't write to point that out. Perhaps for the live version, um, this, this is a compilation of perhaps other materials that you already have. We, we need to make these accessible to students who would need to use a screen reader perhaps later on. The, MP4s that you can actually make for this afterwards can actually be translated if that was a requirement. But I, I think it would definitely take the same sort of thought that you would need to do if you weren't using this. If you were delivering a session where you're in a classroom and you're putting PowerPoint slides up, then you've got to think about making those available later on and having those work on a screen reader. This is a sort of a, right. an interactive, like a classroom session. I think there's quite a few issues there that we would think about. But it's putting together quite a few different things here. So the, the, the chat, for example, can be exported as text. So separately, those files could be made available to those students who would need it afterwards. Much, much as these are live recordings, or live activities, you record as you go along, and those recordings are available for the students. I think JD is going to show us um, the actual application so you can see how that works. But also, they actually, you know, at a later date, they will maybe want to see the MP3 or an MP4 as a video. So there's a quite a lot of options there for you to consider. And, and if yeah, you'd like to come over and have to fit with the That's fine, but we, it, it's just that if it's supposed to be a live event for a student, then you would want the student to be able to fully participate in Yes, and, but, but I think you and I would need to discuss that and think yeah. about how you would no, bring no, that for a, for a session yeah. in, and a, a, in a room like this with your materials. I think you still have to make additional um, facilities available for them after the event is taken away. Mm. Yeah. Thank you all very much. Oh, can I ask you to keep that one for later? Um, thank you all very much for that very informative discussion. I'm sorry to cut it short, but we are running out of time. What we're going to do is we are going to make available to you by email. We're going to make available to you by email the, the part of the presentation where we were going to show you some feedback that we've got from some of our students about their experience and their comments. So if you would like that, I will get your email addresses later. And just to finish up, I'm going to invite JD to tell you about some of the other uses that you might want to put Blackboard Collaborate to, which have been tried by him and Silt colleagues. Thanks, JD. Thanks, sure. Hi, I'm um, JD from the Celt E team, and um, our involvement with this pilot um, is that we used Collaborate to generate a webinar on online submissions to give an overview on online submission which we're um, moving to. So the, there were two reasons mainly why we went for a webinar. One was to give an overview so that the tutors that attended live could decide which one of the workshops to attend um, that we're running on online submission. And the second reason 
was that so we could have a recording so any tutors who did not attend the actual webinar live themselves could experience the webinar and actually get an overview on online submission without actually having to come to a workshop in advance. So there were two reasons for actually doing that. What we're looking at now is an actual recording of a webinar um, which we can send a link to tutors or students for that matter where they can experience the webinar as if they were attending it live and actually there. The section of the Collaborate webinar that I'm going to show, what it actually does, we're in a PowerPoint presentation and we're going to break away from the PowerPoint presentation and go onto the internet. And from the internet, we're going to view a document and we're going to discuss the document and at the end of that, I'm going to push the document out to the audience to give them the opportunity to save the actual document. Now, the important or one of the benefits of using Collaborate is that that can be done within the recording. So in, the month, in a month's time, two months' time, we can send the link to a tutor and they will also get the benefits of the push document to them. So all the documents that were pushed to the audience when it was live will also be pushed to anybody who watches the recording at a later date. And that, that's the piece of the recording I'm going to show you now. Now, right at the beginning, before I um, play the recording, um, this is the first slide that all of the participants see when they log in. So once they have actually clicked on the link and they're actually in the webinar, this is the slide that they see that gives them advice on how to set up their audio, because uh, the actual webinar is not going to be much help if you can't hear what's actually going on. So before, the, before anything is said, once the tutor has clicked on the link and gone into the webinar, this is the first slide that they actually see that gives them advice on how to set up their audio. <coughs> this is the first slide that we actually started speaking on, and there are various tools in Collaborate, and this slide gives an explanation of, to the tools that we're actually going to use and how to use them while the webinar is actually going on. Then it's important to advise the audience if you are going to record the actual session itself. I have put this slide on to remind myself to click the record button, but I forgot to click the record button on three occasions unfortunately, but it can be done automatically you can get the webinar to record automatically in the plan that you actually set. I wanted more control and thought I would remember, but I forgot a couple of times. But it's always good to advise the audience um, that the webinar is going to be recorded if it's actually going to be recorded. After that, um, the presenters are named and any moderators on the actual webinar and then the webinar actually began with this as the first slide. So we progressed through the actual slides and at this point is when we broke out from the presentation and we went onto the internet and I'm just going to play that bit of the recording now for you. The organization. The student organization is accessed from the main page and it is here on the left hand side under featured organizations. It is called how to submit your coursework online. <coughs> and what the student needs to do is just to scroll down to the bottom and if they haven't enrolled already at the bottom it will say enroll. They just click onto that and they are enrolled. They don't need to do anything else. Staff members can also enroll on the module themselves as well. Now, this organization module it gives students all the information they need for submitting a web learn assignment, a turn it in assignment, and also if they have any submission problems. The very last resource is called a student handout, and that student handout has all of the information that students need for preparing their submission files on the first page, 
submitting coursework online, all the information they need on how to submit their coursework online. How to check that their submission was <coughs> correctly and to the correct link. And finally, what to do if the students have any problems with submitting online. And what I will do, I will send you that document now so that you can save it. And once again, if you could give me a green tick just to confirm that you do have the opportunity to save that document. Uh, four out of five, just waiting for one more confirmation. Okay, great. <coughs> can go to the student organization um, to test whether they can... Now, because this is an actual link to the... <coughs> and I'm on the link, I can now download that document, even though I'm watching this webinar three weeks after the actual fact. I can still download that document. If I click on the link just here, it will open up a dialog box that will allow me to <coughs> download and save the actual document. So that is a very useful feature of um, the Collaborate system. And what I actually do now is I, I go on with the um, webinar and hopefully, I hope you remember, let's just go back to that if I can, that before I asked them to download the file, I asked them to confirm that they were able to download the file by putting a green tick on the right hand side here to give it a bit of interactivity so I know exactly how my audience are getting along with the information that I'm giving them. And they can then go on and watch the rest of the webinar and all the files that I push to the audience live they can also download <coughs> when they actually watch the webinar as well. And that was just a short example of how useful um, a couple of the features in Collaborate are. At um, 1 o'clock, uh, we will be in LCM 18 for anyone who wants to ask any technical questions like how do you get your PowerPoint slides into the webinar, how do you break out to the internet, how do you push files to people. <coughs> if anybody's interested in any of that um, information, we will be in LCM 18 from 1 till 2 and be able to answer any of your questions. Do you want to add anything to that, Sue? Um, no. Uh if people can't make it today, I think uh, we've got um, through to the, <coughs> through to Wednesday next week, so Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, if anybody wanted to give us a call or email us at Celti Learning at London Met, we can arrange to meet you. Okay. And are there any questions? Yes, send us. Are you going Hi. to get it or not? What are the chances of us getting it? Because we, we now we, you made us so excited. Don't tell us you don't have the money. Um, my line manager would answer that bit better. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell us 2020. I beg of you. Please tell us we will not have it next year. So does, I think we've got a pretty ch good chance of getting it if there's sufficient support from the ground up. So if you could express the desire more strongly through the various channels. More strongly. <laughs> Can you really handle me no, most I, 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 think, I think we've got a pretty good chance. Uh, I think the question is when. Sue's got something to add at that point. Um, <coughs> ISS and CELT are actually going to be um, going through a scoping exercise to see what would be the um, opportunities, what opportunities and benefits would it give if we went university-wide. So I, I know there are some bids in, the 2020 bids in, to actually think about some form of web conferencing in with whatever the bid happens to be. So it's likely that it may um, perhaps become available. Shilly can talk to you about that. But if you do actually get asked um, what use you might make of it, please, you know, if you see that uh, request coming through to see with what you think of it, please do answer. We'll be in touch about that. Sheila? Just, just as a quick response to that, so I'll send this. I spoke to um, Trisha about it, and they, Blackboard are. Um, I have said that we could buy a sort of like a, a paid for pilot to run it for an extended period there. 
and he probably can get the money together for that so that we could start before the big bids come in to make it permanent as well. Sure. Yeah, it, what I'd like to add to that is that no modern university can be without synchronous online support if they're serious about distance learning. So there's a lot of focus on that. There is work um, in, in a university group called the Online Learning Group where these issues are being uh, surfaced and brought to the attention of, of those that need to think about these things. But it, it's, it's just a no-brainer. If we're going to support students at, at a distance, they have to be supported properly with the right sort of um, software and hardware and everything else. Um, so, you know, I, I can't say yes, but I do know there's a very strong focus on it. And I, I personally, I believe that what's good for the distance learning students is good, good for our face-to-face mm -hmm. -face students. So we can maximise... Yeah, because these. during the two strikes this year, I mean, yeah. you had this already. Exactly. You know. When, when it snowed and we two, can't three get three maybe. Um, so we have a, and half the students can't get in. Do we have a question at the back there? Sorry, I was just whatever tablets we all end up with, if we do get them, does the collaborate work on all tablets and all platforms? And oh jeez, all tablets well, and all you know platforms. I mean, <laughs> if, if, if you're going to say that somebody might be at home who's got a Samsung, say, yeah, for example, that's, yeah, and that's, then will it not work on that so they have to buy an iPad? No, no. No. In, in, in fact, the, the CELT E team unit have been testing on various types of tablets. Uh, and you know, one of the things one has to look at is, is whether whatever we support does iOS, does Android, does Windows. Um, so it's, it's you know, something that folks want to see. So I just must say that if you're actually running and you're a moderator actually trying to deliver one of these conferences, then you do need to be on a PC of some sort. But to be a participant, so if you're a student for it, or if you're actually participating yourself, then yes, um, across tablets, phones, we've had people coming in on... Uh, and there isn't a, it doesn't limit, it's not a limited participation on some, some stuff. I mean, I do, do I think you remember some of the students having difficulty with, with Apple stuff. Things, everything that I've put on web learn in every form. They yeah, can see some things and not others. It actually yeah. looks a little bit different. Yeah. What you're looking at there now is how you would see it on, on a PC or, yeah. or, or, or a Mac PC. Yeah, well, I put, I put myself a Windows 8 tablet instead of my Android phone, Turnitin marking, because Android didn't work well with Turnitin. So you can see things, you can do some things, and it um, doesn't support Microsoft Offers and that. That's what you can't do this. Okay. Yeah, as yeah. JD is there right. delivering okay. that session, you would need to be on a PC. Okay, on that note, can yeah. I pass it to Shara to close the session as we've reached the time? Yeah. Thank you, JD. <coughs> I just want to, again, thank you all very much for coming. I hope you have found this interesting and informative. Did you already mention the workshop again? One o'clock. Okay, so if you would like to go and have a quick play or ask any further questions from the CELT E team, then please make your way to LCM 18 for one o'clock or shortly afterwards. If you're going to be a lot late, probably let them know so they don't nick off and have a coffee. Uh, we've, yeah, we don't have the system yet, do we? No, you don't have the system yet. So at the beginning what I said, Chris, was that one of the things we're oh. trying to do is to um, show everybody the potential so that if you are interested then maybe you can help us support some bids that are going to go forward hopefully through the MET 2020 process to try and get this either for some parts of FLSC, for all of FLSC or preferably university wide. Okay, so that's where we started. Um, lost my thread there. So let me thank then Sheila and Sean, Sue for many uh, valuable chip-ins, of course JD, all the other people that have contributed behind the scenes, Richard is definitely one of them. Thank you very much, Richard, for all of your work. Um, William, I can see there, I don't know where the rest of you are, but thank you all very much for making it possible to get to this point. I have got some very short, I promise, feedback forms that I would be very grateful if you would fill in. They also allow you the opportunity either to take my email address off there if you want to email me for the slides, or if you're happy to combine your email address with your comments, to provide your email address on there, whichever you're most happy and comfortable with is fine um, if you wanted to get the slides. 
and if there are any further questions that you come up with later, again, feel free to email me or any of the presenters who I'm sure would be happy to answer your questions. And thank you all again for coming.